Amen. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. That's what the songwriter says. Amen. Nobody can do me like Jesus. Thank God for him because he cannot fail. Jesus Christ promised never to leave us nor to forsake us. Promised to be a very pleasant help in the time of need, in the time of trouble. Will he, will he not do so? Yes, he will. Because he has never let us down. He has never failed. He's an awesome Savior. Amen? Amen. He's the one, the blessed one. When affliction rocked my soul and the wave of billow rolled, Jesus is the one. Amen? Amen. Thank be to God. Um, the other day, I'm just going to show you a little bit. The other day, I was thinking the other day of how great Jesus is. Uh, uh, the Bible says, greater than Noah is here, uh, greater than Solomon is here, greater than Jonah is here. He's great. At the very beginning of the ministry, he called 12 men to follow him. And he told him to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom. And after a while, he turned around and he called 72 more. And he told them the very same thing. They went away and uh, they did exactly as he told them. Amen. But they run and coming back and say, Lord, even the devil is subject to us. And he told them, don't you look at that. Don't be too much uh, concerned about it. Be concerned that your name is written down in glory. God don't want us to be to, so wrapped up and tied up in the miracle and the sign of wonder, but to follow him, Jesus Christ. And I was looking at one verse that really moved me all week. You know, I've been looking at this one verse. I'm going to do one verse. And he was speaking to his disciples. And he said to them, Luke 9 and 23 says, and he was saying to them all, all, not missing nobody, everybody to hear this. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must, it's a must, it's not a maybe, it's a must, must, say with me, must, must deny yourself. If we don't deny ourselves of the passion and desire of this world, we can't follow Christ. It's going to be hard for us to follow Christ. Very hard. Because if we don't deny ourselves, we can't hear from him. He want to talk to us. He want to share with us some wisdom and knowledge and understanding. But if we're so wrapped up in our desire and passion, for myself and this world, then we're not going to follow him too long. Because the enemy is like a lion lurking, just looking for you to just slip up one time. Just one time. He'll take you down. I look at these, uh, I'm just, you know, I feel sorry for the wildebeest. <laughs> They're the bottom of the food chain for the lion. I mean, the lion just wait for the weak and feeble and just grab it, snatch it, and pull it to the side and eat it up like that. You know, I said, oh, my God, the wildebeest ain't got no defense more than his legs. <laughs> and if his legs not strong, he ain't going nowhere. He's only a lunch meat for the lions. That's the same way with us. God has given us hind feet. He said, run, <laughs> run. Amen. Run for your life. God gives hind feet to leap away from the enemy. But the enemy, he's not gonna let he's not gonna stop steering you down. He's always looking to pull you down until you die. So we gotta follow Christ closely, very close. We can't let no space between Christ. We gotta fill the gap. So he's saying, 
If you're going to follow me, you must. It's a must. There's no way you're going to get to heaven that to follow Christ closely. Deny himself. We're going to deny ourselves completely. We're going to sell out. Many have fallen along the wayside. I'm sorry to see I've fallen because they're not really, they have not really denied themselves. And they're not fighting. And they're not working. You know, I thank God for pastors and handle like what we got here. I mean, they're here to help. And some people think, well, because I'm going through the trials and tests, I'm going to slide off by myself and I'm going to mope and weep by myself. That's the silliest thing you ever do. You need help, come to you. God gave us pastors and elders for this reason to comfort and to strengthen and to build you up. That's why we're here. We're not here for the money. We don't believe in that. We're here to preach the gospel and tell the truth and show you the way. So he had 72 of them turn away from him because he told them, you, you have got to drink and eat of me to have eternal life. And they looked at him and said, man, it's a hard thing you have to do. But they didn't wait on Christ. They took off running. Judas deny him who saw the signs and wonders of miracle. But when I look at it, it says, these men had a great pastor, a great counselor, a great mentor, and they left him. They left him because they did not deny themselves and follow. They didn't follow Christ closely. They were concerned about themselves and not Christ. You see, he says here, and take up your cross and kill that flesh daily. As Paul says, mortify that flesh. We got to kill this thing because if we give it a chance, it will stand up again. It will raise up and stand you up. It will tell you, I want this. Because I know, my flesh talked to me too. He told me, I want this. And it's not giving up. It's always talking. That's why we got to deny it and kill it daily. Not only today and skip tomorrow and go. There's no skipping here. There's no skipping in the tulips here. We got to kill this thing. He told us, he gave us strict instruction daily. We got to kill this thing daily. If we don't kill it daily, it'll rise up somewhere or the other. It will come up through the cracks one day on you. See, we got to close every gap and cracks in our life and give this flesh no space, none at all to rise up. Because it loved the passion and desire of this world. It loved the things of this world. It loved the pleasures of this world. Saints, I encourage you. Let us deny ourselves daily and take up a cross and follow Jesus Christ. Why? Because he has the wisdom and the knowledge and understanding to teach us how to live above sin, reproach. He has the power. He has instruction, counsel for us. That's why he tells us, follow me daily and you will be blessed. You will be delivered. You will be healed. You will be set free. Just follow him. Because no, there's nobody like Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless you real good. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 2, if you would. Hebrews chapter 2. Hallelujah. How many of you thank God for his word? How many of you thank God for his truth? <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2, start at verse 12, when Elder Waldron first got up and he was talking about the apostles when they went out in Matthew chapter 10 and were operating under the authority of the Christ. They came back and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in thy name. And Jesus told them, don't take joy in this, but take joy in the fact that your name is written in heaven. 
How many of, of you understand that if your name is written in heaven, that's what guarantees that you get the blessings of the kingdom? Because to have your name written in heaven is what signifies that you are a member of that city. That you are a member of that kingdom. I know here in this country, especially in this time, with everything that's going on, how many of you understand, a lot of stress is being put on whether or not someone is a citizen. Amen? And how many of you understand, a lot of people want to be a citizen of this country. Because as imperfect as this country is, it's a lot better than what some people have. And I don't blame them for wanting to search for a better life. Amen. Many of us, uh, that, that's why my family came over. They came over in the 50s from, from Hungary. They came from the Ukraine. They came from Poland. They were searching a better life. And I don't knock them for coming here searching a better life. But don't think that just because you got here, you've arrived. Because I'm searching for a city whose builder and maker is God. How many of you understand that this country fails in comparison to the city that I want to be a partaker of, to the city that I want to be a member of? Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's start at verse 12 for me if we could right here, Bishop. Hebrews 12 and verse 12. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read the, the entire chapter, but Hebrews 12 is a powerful chapter. Hebrews 12, starting at verse 12. Notice what the scriptures say. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak. Th that's what God is calling us to do. Strengthen the hands that are weak. When somebody's weak, especially among us, God's calling us to strengthen them. Paul spoke the same thing to the, to the church at Thessalonica. Amen. Strengthen those that are weak. God, God doesn't want those that are weak to eventually become increasingly, increasingly weak until they eventually fade off. All right. hey, hey. It's a good place to say amen. amen. Unless you believe that God would have some to perish. But how many of you understand? God is not his will that any should perish. So if, if his will that all should come to everlasting life and come to repentance, how many of you understand? Somebody's got to step in and help along the way. We understand that people go through trials, they go through struggles, they go through tribulations, but we are called by God to strengthen those when they're in a time of need. Tell your neighbor, I want to be used to strengthen somebody. I want to strengthen somebody. I don't want to be a hindrance. It's another good place to say amen. Can I get a witness? I don't want to, I don't want to be a hindrance to somebody. I want to be used to strengthen somebody. The scriptures tell us not in a suggestive fashion, not in a suggestive fashion, but as a commandment, strengthen the weak. Read it for me one more time, Bishop. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak. Strengthen the hands that are weak because God desires those hands to work, but they can't work if they're weak. Amen. So they need to be strengthened so that they can do the work that God has called them to do. Strengthen the hands that are weak. Keep coming. Notice this. And the knees that are feeble. And the knees that are. Tell your neighbor the body. Notice what he's talking about. The body. The hands. The knees. He's talking about the body. That part of the body that's not doing so well. Strengthen it. It's another good place to say amen. Keep coming for me, Bishop. And make straight, pa straight paths for your feet uh -huh. so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint. Now you make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is what? So that the limb which is what, saints? Will not be. So how do you fix the limb which is lame? Read it for me one more time. And make straight paths for your feet. Make straight paths for your feet. So now you making straight paths for your feet then put you in the position to help the leg that is lame. But you can't help the leg that is lame if you don't have straight paths for your own feet. When you walk a crooked path within yourself, you don't have the strength or power or spiritual authority to heal that lame which is that limb which is lame. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when somebody else needs to be strengthened? 
You take heed to yourself. You take heed to your path. You make sure you're walking down the right path because it, if you're not walking down the right path, you can't rightfully help somebody else that can't walk. Read it for me one more time, Bishop. Notice the scriptures. And make straight paths for your feet. And make straight paths for your feet. Amen. So that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint. Hallelujah. But rather be healed. You know how you live your life impacts other people. I'm preaching to every single one of us in here. I'm preaching to myself. Amen. The way you live your life impacts those around you. Whether it be negatively or positively, you're impacting people somehow. Either you're being a light to people or you're displaying darkness to people. Can I get a witness? You're like God. That, that's the way God has ordained it. God created his creation in his own image. T -t Tell your neighbor, I'm committed. I I'm created in the image of God. Tell your other neighbor, I'm created in the image of God. You understand humanity can't see God. All humanity sees is other humanity. So therefore, when they see the behavior of humanity, what does that cause within the mind frame of people? When people see how other people act, they immediately take it out on God. Whether it be good or whether it be bad. God said, my name is blasphemed among the Gentiles for your cause. They're not blaspheming me because what I did. They're blaspheming me because of what you did. Because you're created in the image of God. Therefore, your characteristics, your actions cause people to reflect on their opinion of God. You understand what I'm saying? That we're created in the image of God. So the way we act can influence the way people think about God. I already quoted it, but, but Paul said, or, or God said in the Old Testament to the, to the Israelites, my name is blasphemed among the Gentiles for your cause. Christ, on the flip side, said, be a light unto all the world that they might see your good works and... Glorify your father, which is in heaven. So now your good works can bring praise to God or you not walking the right path can cause people to blaspheme God. Because you're created in the image of God. Saints, you are. As close to seeing God as people will ever get. So what are you manifesting? That's a deep thought, is it not? Read it for me one more time, Bishop. Notice this. And make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be out of joint, uh -huh. but rather be healed. Amen. How many of you understand? God wants to bring healing to the lame, to the limb which is lame. That's the will of God. He wants to bring healing. Notice this. Yes, sir. Pursue peace with all men. Pursue. So because you're characteristics your actions reflect the way people view God here's how you need to live pursue peace tell your neighbor you got to pursue peace go ahead and tell two more people you got to pursue peace let's make sure we understand that tell somebody else you got to pursue peace we got to make sure we understand that in our spirits amen because the way you act can influence the lives of those that are around you, you have got to pursue. Saints, peace is important. Who wants to live a life where there is no peace? Maybe a lot of us do. I don't know. I personally do not want to live a life where I don't have peace, especially with fellow creatures. Fellow creation, my brethren, talking about of the human race. Amen. I desire to have peace with who, Bishop? Oh, man. Tell your neighbor, that's everybody. 
That's the will of God that we have peace with all men. If we don't have peace in a certain relationship, God desires that we do whatever we can do to ensure that we have peace in that relationship. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is what? The kingdom of God. Amen? Keep coming for me, Bishop. Notice this. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. And the sanctification, somebody say holiness. The sanctification, the holiness, without which no man shall. So, so simplify it. Live holy and seek peace. Without which no man will see the Lord. You won't rightfully be saved without seeking peace and seeking true holiness. But as we've come to learn over the past couple of weeks, saints, true holiness cannot be obtained without loving God and loving your neighbor. Which means you've got to seek that peace with your neighbor in order to truly have holiness. For without which no man shall see the Lord. Notice this. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See to it that no one comes short of the But you say, no, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, past tense. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. But once you come into Christ, we talked about that last week. It's possible that you can frustrate grace. It's possible that you can live your life in such a manner where you're not walking after the spirit, where you're not truly trying to live for God. And you know what winds up happening? You fall short. Of the grace of God. Amen. And, and Christians walk around today. They say no grace. I got God's grace. God's grace covers me no matter what. No matter where I go. No matter what I do. God's grace is there. Then what is the scripture talking about when it says you can fall short of the glory of God. You can fall short of the grace of God. You can frustrate grace. You can fall short from Grace, that's a powerful concept. Read it for me one more time, Bishop. Notice this. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Amen. Keep on coming. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. That no root of springs up and when relationships don't get mended, bitterness springs up. And once bitterness springs up, you have trouble. Bitterness springs up and you have trouble. Saints, that's how lambs get limb. That's how hands get weak. Because bitterness springs up and bitterness starts affecting you in every aspect of your life, in every aspect of your walk with God. When you get bitter and when you harbor bitterness, you start hating people that you have no business hating. You start thinking, why am I even mad at that brother? He didn't do anything to me. It's because bitterness starts to defile you in every area and aspect of your life. That's why it's so essential that you seek peace and pursue it with all men. Keep coming, Bishop. Notice this. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Uh Uh-huh. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. Uh And by it, many be defiled. And by it, many be what? One person harboring bitterness affects more than just themselves. Bitterness is contagious. And when somebody harbors it and operates in it, you'll start realizing that that starts rubbing off on those that are around them. You ever got around somebody who was like that and you just started... It's like a weight of negativity, a weight of unrighteousness just starts working against you to where you got to step back and say, oh, my God, I can't let this overcome me because somebody who's bitter, who's harboring bitterness goes after whoever they can and wants to impart that bitterness into them. They'll start telling them why they're bitter. So then that person starts saying, yeah, this person's justified in their bitterness. Then the person that was told about their bitterness starts harboring that bitterness in their own heart. And that problem starts being spread. Next thing you know, you got a movement of bitterness, a click of bitterness. That happened all because peace wasn't being pursued. That's a powerful verse. 
That's why we got to walk blamelessly before God and before men. And if any point at any time in your life you feel like you're harboring that, you got to make sure you take care of it. Is that too, that's too basic. Amen. But it's truth. And not just is it truth, but th- let me keep moving. And then, then I'll get a little bit more into that in a minute. Notice this. Keep coming for me, Bishop. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau uh-huh. who sold his own birthright for a single meal. How many of you understand? This is this is the church. He's talking concerning people who are in the church. He doesn't want he wants people being holy. He wants people seeking peace. He doesn't want people being godless, people being immoral. Understand the call is for the church to be righteous, to be holy, to walk in peace, to be sanctified, not living as Esau, who did what, Bishop? Sold his own birthright for a single meal. Sold his own birthright for what? You know, that's what happens when somebody gets weak. When somebody gets weak spiritually, the first opportunity that comes along for them For them to sell their birthright, they do it because they want to feed their weakness with natural food. Thinking if they partake of the flesh, it will satisfy that weakness that they have, that void that they have. But saints, the world will never satisfy that void that you have. The flesh will never satisfy it. James said, it'd be better for a man not to have known the way of truth than to know the way of truth and turn away from it. Why? Because once you've been exposed to the knowledge of the truth, that's something you can't get away from. It follows you while you're in your sin. It follows you when you're out there in the world. It f- and it's always in the back of your mind. I've learned a better way than this. Can I get a witness? Keep coming for me, Bishop. Notice this. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Uh For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. He found no place for repentance, though he... Look, just because you cry don't mean you're seeking repentance. Amen. Amen. Sometimes you cry because you're an emotional wreck. And outwardly you're crying because inwardly there's such a struggle because you know you ought not be living like that, but you want to live like that. And outwardly you're manifesting tears, but that doesn't always necessarily mean you're truly seeking a place of repentance. God knows the heart. God's the judge. That's not for us to decide. Lest God should somehow reveal it and desire us to speak a word. Or try and strengthen or help grant that person repentance. But God knows what's going on in your heart. Just because he sees tears don't mean this person's sincere. And we look at tears like if we cry, we've had a spiritual experience. Listen, my, my kid falls down and cries all the time. That don't mean he's having a spiritual experience. Sometimes you cry because that's the only way you know how to deal with what's going on in your flesh at that time. Amen. Can I get a witness? People cry. Sometimes you get overwhelmed. Look, sometimes you see something sad on the news and you cry. That don't mean you're having a spiritual experience. A spiritual experience births change. Godly sorrow works repentance. You ain't ha- look, you can't have a true spiritual experience and not be changed. Amen. He coming for me, Bishop. Notice this. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched. Now notice this. He tells you to do all of these things. Understand that everything he just spoke is a high, a high level of righteousness, is it not? Everything, because he's talking about strengthening. The hands that are weak. He's talking about bringing healing to the limbs that are lame. He's talking about seeking peace with all men. He's talking about living in the sanctification and holiness of God. He's talking about don't be immoral. Don't be fornicators. Don't sell your soul for one meal. And then he goes on to tell you why we live to that standard of righteousness. 
Here's the reason why we live to that standard of righteousness. Read it for me, Bishop. Notice this. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched. Because you haven't come to a mountain which can be touched. Notice what he says. Watch this. And to a blazing fire uh-huh. and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind. How many of you understand what he's describing is Mount Sinai when, Lo- when Moses received the law? He's describing the mountain that Moses went up to. Now, the apostle is telling us to live at a higher standard of righteousness because you have not come unto a natural city. Notice, keep going. And to the blast of a trumpet Uh and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. How many of you understand he's talking about what happened in the old covenant? When God went to meet Moses on the mountain, how many of you understand the rest of the congregation of Israel said, we don't want nothing to do with that. They, They said when Moses came back, they told Moses they didn't even want to talk to God. They told Moses, you go to the mountain, you talk to God, and then you come back and tell us what he says. So now he's saying, we haven't come unto a mountain like they came unto in the Old Testament. You haven't come unto a mountain where you're not going to partake in what's going on. You've come unto a mountain where now you yourself are called to interact with the Almighty God for yourself. You can't have a relationship with God through somebody else. You've got to take it upon yourself to live that standard of righteousness. In the Old Testament, they were just trying to live through Moses. Now the apostles telling them, look, you can't live through your pastor. You can't live through your leader. You can't live through somebody you look up to in the faith. You've got to come unto this city for yourself. And you've got to adopt the culture of the city for yourself. And you've got to live according to the rules and regulations for yourself. You've got to embrace this way of living for yourself. You've got to get it in your spirit. Keep coming for me, Bishop. Notice this. For they could not bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. They they didn't want anything to do with it, nor could they have anything to do with it. Because they didn't want to go to the mountain. God said, okay, nothing's allowed to come onto this mountain, not even a beast. Or it's going to be stoned. So everybody had a relationship with God from afar off. That is what you get in the Old Testament. A relationship with God that is that, that you're trying to keep commandments without actually being put in contact with the creator. That's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. In the old covenant, when Christ was crucified, the veil which separated the rest of God's creation from his holy of holies was torn. And everyone then had access. So God now is calling everyone to come unto that spiritual mountain. You follow me? Notice what he says. Watch this. And so terrible was the sight uh-huh. that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. That, that so, so terrible was the sight that Moses himself said he was full of fear and full of trembling. Notice this. But you have come to Mount Zion. But you, you have, you have, you have, you have, tell your neighbor, I have come. Now he's, he's, he's making a transition from when the old covenant, they didn't actually come unto God, but now you have come. Read it for me one more time, Bishop. But you have come to Mount Zion. Uh Uh-huh. And to the city of the living God. And to the city of the. This is a spiritual city. This is a spiritual kingdom. This is a spiritual thing. You have spiritually come unto the city. Which is the city of the living God. How many of you understand in the city of the living God. The laws of the living God abide. How many of you understand in the city of the living God. There ain't no war up in that city. In the city of the living God, there's peace. So why was he in Hebrews telling them to seek peace with all men? Because you've come unto this city. And because you're, you've come unto this city, 
you now have to live according to the spiritual rules and regulations that abide in that city. That's why we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Physically, we're here, but spiritually, we're there. Seated with Christ in heavenly places. Set your affections not on things which are beneath, but set your affections on things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. You got to see to it that you don't get caught up in. The carnality that's going on down here. You got to live in such a manner that you're living according to the righteousness which is there. And bringing about change down here. Sometimes I feel like when we say. You, sometimes I feel like when we say we, we've got to be consumed with the things of heaven. That doesn't mean that you should be con so consumed. Well, let, let me reword this. You should be so consumed with the things of heaven that you care what's going on down here. Amen. Because God isn't calling you to change heaven. God's calling you to change earth. God wants you to be so rooted in heavenly things that now you're able to bring healing to the lame limb. He wants you to be so consumed with spiritual things that now you can strengthen the hands that are weak. He wants you to be so consumed with heavenly things that you can go to that root that's springing up bitterness and you can bring healing to it. That you can bring peace. That you can bring reconciliation. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall see God. You're so consumed with heavenly things that you want to bring about change down here. You're so consumed with heavenly things that you want to bring heaven to earth. You can't be consumed with heavenly things and make no difference while you're here. That's a fact. That's what he's trying to say. That, that you're able to bring forth this level of change in people's lives because you're a member of that city. Saints, God's calling us to make a difference in people's lives. Whether it be financially giving, we ought to be doing that. We've got to be looking for opportunities to help. How many of you understand? That's part of what Christ called us to do. It might it ain't got to be money. Maybe it's food. Whatever. you got to live a lifestyle of giving. you got to live a lifestyle where you're bringing forth change in people's lives. Not just na people have natural needs. God wants to use you to meet their natural needs as well as their spiritual needs. God wants to use you to help people to make a difference, saints. Why are we making a difference? People say, don't be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. I'm telling you, be so heavenly minded that you impact this world. Christ is the most heavenly minded person you'll ever meet. And he was impacting lives. Both spiritual needs and he also fed the 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes. He didn't have any money. Amen. But he still found a way to feed them. This is the fast that I have called you to fast. Oh, we're going to. How many of you understand when we fast spiritually, we make it about us? Right? Like I'm fasting because I want God to give me a revelation. Amen. I'm fasting because I want to get closer to God. When you read Isaiah chapter 58, God tells you this is the fast that I've called you to, that you don't eat and you take the food that you would have eaten and you gave it to somebody who didn't have food. So now we got to a, a level where, God, I don't have any money to feed anybody, but do you got some food in your fridge? And if you do have food in your fridge, why don't you skip a meal and fast? And instead of eating it later, give it to somebody else who doesn't have anything to eat. Because I promise you, you might not have any money in the bank, but you got food in the fridge. Why don't you break a little something off and help somebody? You might not have money in the bank, but you got clothes you don't wear. Why don't you come up off them and help somebody that ain't got nothing?
God is calling you to impact people's lives. Meet spiritual needs, meet natural needs, whatever you got to do. Displaying the love of God is all of those. Why do we do that? Because we're a member of the heavenly city. I feel like sometimes we talked about the love of God for week after week after week. Then I think we had a service where we started talking about something else. Then it's almost like, okay, time to move on. God said, oh, no. You move on from that, you'll lose your salvation. You better get it a part of you. You got to impact the world. I feel that in the spirit. Because so, sometimes, look, we got to be sure we don't resort to the flesh like, oh, it's time to move on. We're done with that series. When, when God is ingraining something in us week after week after week. He wants it to get embedded in our spirit, man, to where it becomes a part of us. We don't move on from the teaching. That teaching that we receive becomes revelation, and that revelation becomes something that we live our life by. That's what God desires. Read that verse for me one more time, Bishop. You have come unto where? I forgot what verse we're you have about. come to Mount Zion and uh, to the city of the living God. Hallelujah. The heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly. What part of the heavenly Jerusalem? Not the natural Jerusalem. Amen. The heavenly Zion. To the heavenly Jerusalem. Keep coming for me, Bishop. And to myriads of angels. And to. That's who you got your citizenship with. You're part of a heavenly kingdom. Angels are part of that kingdom. You come to a heavenly city, to the city of the almighty God, to the new Jerusalem, to a myriad of angels. To what else, Bishop? To the general assembly Uh and church of the firstborn. Hallelujah. Who are enrolled in heaven. Who are. That's the only church enrollment your name needs to be on anywhere. It don't matter if your name is on First Baptist, Second Baptist, First Presbyterian, First Apostolic, First Pentecostal. Is your name on the assembly of the church of the first board? You don't get your name written on that until you operate according to the rules and regulation of the first born. Jesus told the apostles, don't rejoice that the demons are subject unto you. Rejoice that your name is written. Rejoice that you've left everything and you're following me. So now you're a member of the only church that exists. There is no other church. Amen. How many of you understand this one Lord, one faith. One baptism. Right before that, it said there's one body and one spirit. There's not two bodies of Christ. There's one church. It's this city, the new Jerusalem, and either your name is written in it or your name is not. If you are a part of that city, you got to live according to the righteousness that is in that city. Keep coming. Notice this. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn Uh who are enrolled in heaven and to God. The judge of all. And to God, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And to the spirits of the righteous. That's the city we're a part of. Saints, I don't care nothing about being American. I'm, I'm, not, say, I'm not saying that. I'm not glad I live here. I'm not saying that there's another country I'd rather live in. I'm just saying this is more important to me than anything in this world. This is more important to me than anything in this world. That I I live according to the rules and regulations that were in that city. You understand? That's how Christ lived his life. Christ lived his life according to the principles of righteousness that are lived out in that city. When you read through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, all of that is the righteousness that's practiced in that city. Now, I wish I.
Can you come up for me, Bishop? Notice this. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Hallelujah. And to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Which speaks better than the... How many of you understand when Abel was slew, that the scripture said, God said, the voice of Abel does cry out unto me. How many of you understand the life of the flesh is in the blood? That, that it, it, when you read through the scriptures, it's almost as if the life that's in the blood speaks to God. How many of you understand Christ talked about that, the, 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 the blood which was shed of all the prophets? When you read the book of Revelation, it talks about the souls in Revelation 6. When will you avenge our blood? Saints, blood is speaking. And now the writer of Hebrews said, we come unto Christ whose blood speaks better things than that of Abel. Hallelujah. I mean, you understand that's a deep statement but saints this is the city that god has called us to be a partaker of because we are a partaker of this city we got to make sure we're bringing about change in this world right now let's take a minute and feel after god how many of you understand when the disciples asked christ to teach us to pray christ taught them that thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is god wants the same thing that's being done in heaven he wants us to manifest that here on the earth, saints. God wants us to impact the lives of the people that he has placed in our lives to this extent to where we can help them become a member of this city. We'll help them meet physical needs, help them meet spiritual needs, do whatever we got to do to help them. Won't you pray that prayer within yourself right now? Won't you just speak unto the Lord and feel after the Lord for just a minute? We got to be used by God. He brings up Isaiah 58, and so many times we fast looking for God to bless us. And, and as I, Isaiah 58, God is telling his people, I want you to fast to bless somebody else. And I feel like we bring that same mentality into church so many times is, well, what am I going to get from this service? What am I going to get from this prayer meeting? What am I going to get from whatever interaction I'm, I'm 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 looking to get something out of it but when we come to god the sacrifice that we offer to him is to be a blessing to somebody else and in doing that he who gives shall never lack he talked about the limb in um hebrews 12 the limb that was out of joint Strengthen the weak hands, the feeble knees. And while he was speaking that, um, a passage came to my, my heart that I feel like I should share with you. Galatians chapter number 6. So much of what he said here, when, I hope you're taking notes. And if you are, I hope you'll take these scriptures home and meditate on them. Because this Galatians 6 and Hebrews 12 go very much hand in hand. So that the root of bitterness does not spring up is what the writer of Hebrews said. But Paul talks about that same dynamic here. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, that's the key. You can't be carnal trying to restore other people but you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness each one and this is another key each one looking to yourself remember he just talked about that in hebrews 4 how that when we try to help others we got to take heed to ourselves that whatever they're wrestling with doesn't isn't imparted to us in any way if they're dealing with a lack of faith and whatever they're spewing out of their mouth is seeds and we've got to make sure that the seeds that they're spewing in our direction don't take root in our own hearts so that their lack of faith which we're trying to restore them from doesn't eventually become our lack of faith 
Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too, so that you too will not be tempted. Now this is interesting. Verses 2. And verse 5 seems to contradict each other. Watch this. Verse 2, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. What did Christ say the law was? Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Fulfill the law of Christ by bearing your brother's burdens. And he's in the context of somebody who's struggling, somebody who's falling short. Help bear that person's burdens. Do whatever it takes to help try to reconcile that brother back to God. But you got to take heed to yourself. Bear ye one another's burdens, King James. Fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. What Paul is saying here is you think you're so spiritual as to restore other people, but you're not. You can't even get yourself right yet. How are you going to, how are you going to, Jesus said it this way. How are you going to pull the beam out of your brother's eye when you can't even deal with the speck that's in your own eye? First, first, get rid of the beam in your eye. And then you can help to deal with the speck in your brother's eye. He wants us to minister, but the key is we first got to deal with ourselves. Get ourselves right. Get ourselves in a good spiritual position. And we should live. We, our goal should be to get to where we constantly live in such a spiritual, spiritual condition that at the moment somebody falls, we're ready to help them then. We don't have to go through a soul-searching period for six weeks trying to get ourselves right so we can get ready to help somebody else. We've got to live in that constant state. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself and you will be tempted just like the person you're trying to minister to and bear their burdens. The same spirit of doubt, lack of faith that's on them will also jump on you. For if anyone thinks he has something when he has nothing, he deceives himself. Verse 4, watch this though. But each one must examine his own work and then... He will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone. In other words, get yourself right. Keep yourself right. And then live in such a state that you are looking to help someone else. Right? We can't help one another because we're all in a mess ourselves. Get ourselves together. Seek perfection. And live, and that's the goal, right? We, y'all kind of zombied out on me. Y'all tired? It's been a long time. By American standards, it's been a long time since we started preaching. Don't zombie out on me. Right? That's the goal. Is to get to where we live in such a spiritual state that at any moment we see somebody, we ought to see them slipping before they slip. To be so in tune with the Spirit of God that we sense When somebody's slipping before they slip. And start working towards helping them. But we're we're in that tunnel vision. And we're so worried about. But I need this from God. And I need that from God. And and, and God's saying. I have given you everything you need. To be a blessing to someone else. I'm not giving you anything else. Until you start giving to other people. He that gives. Shall never lack. The key to never lacking is not gaining. The key to never lacking is giving. We've got an opposite. Gain, gain, get, 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 and I'll never lack. And the opposite is true. Give, 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 and you will never lack. For God loves, there's that relationship again, loves a cheerful giver. Give, 
And it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give to your bosom. But what's the key? Give, not gain to get, give to get. The giver shall never lack, not the getter. So the goal then is we live in such a constant spiritual state, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, that we can reach in and pull somebody else out of the fire. That's the way Jude said the same thing, same principle is written in Jude. Keeping yourself unspotted from the world and make a difference in their lives, pulling them out of the fire. But each one of us must examine his own work. And then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. In other words, your boasting is not in, well, I helped them get their mess together. Your boasting is, I got my mess together. And it, this is, when it says boasting, this is not something we're going to get a microphone, stand on the street corner and say, hey, I got it all together. In other words, this is your confidence before God. Not that you helped everybody else get their lives together, but I got my own life together. And obviously that can only come through the grace and the power and the mercy of God. But it does take work on our part as well. And that's where I make my boast in the Lord. Verse, verse 5, now watch this. No, give me verse 2 first. Bear ye one another's burdens and, fulfill, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So he tells us to bear one another's burdens. Then verse 5, notice what it says. For each one... will bear his own load. How can you bear somebody else's burdens when you can't even bear your own? That's what's missing between three, three verses three and four tell us the transition between two and five. That's the link. We got to get ourselves right so that we can help somebody else. Verse six. The one who is taught in the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Remember, we're still in the context of somebody who's falling and somebody who's spiritual restoring them. Now, notice the relationship. The one who is taught in the word, the one who is helped, the ones whose burdens are bared are then to turn around and share all good things with the one who teaches him. There should be a reciprocation here. First, the person in need gets helped, and then there's a turn, and, and, and the, the person who helped is helped. Right? He who gives shall never lack. Give and men shall, be, shall give into your bosom. There's a cycle in God whereby the body edifies itself in love. The one who is taught in the word is to share all good things with him, with the one who teaches him. Watch this. Everybody quotes this verse right here. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows in the offering plate, this will he also reap in money. Right? That's always how that verse is quoted. You always hear people quoting that verse in relation to money. That verse has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with what you're doing to help others. What you're doing to give to somebody else's life. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever. This is the law of the harvest. Whatever you sow... That's what you're going to reap. If you don't sow, don't expect nothing in return. That's the law of the harvest. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. But the context is giving into others' lives, helping restore them, helping minister to them, helping them keep the faith. Verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh... The one who's just concerned with his life, got tunnel vision, give, give, give. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. The Old Testament talks about you take your money and put it into a bag with holes. You're trying to hoard all this for yourself and you're putting it in a bag that's got holes. And just as fast as you put it in there, you lose it. Why do people's lives seem to be that way? Whatever they get immediately is taken away from them. Why? Not sowing. Not sowing into anybody else. They sow into the flesh, but they're not sowing to anybody else or to the spirit. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap money. Something way more valuable than money. 
not even to be compared. You will reap eternal life. Our salvation has everything to do with how we interact with one another. We limit our salvation to how we deal with God. We struggle in that relationship. And we're so obsessed with ourselves that that's all we worry about is us and God, us and God. And we can't even get that right. When our salvation is also tied in with, with how we relate with one another just as much as it is how we relate to God. And what would happen if I'm trying to get from God, get from God, get from God. If I would just get off of my selfish self, start investing in the lives of other people, ministering to them, loving them, encouraging them, edifying them, doing whatever I could to bear whatever burden they're facing in life. And I'm giving, giving, giving. God said, he who gives will not lack. So I'm praying for God to give me things he's not going to give me until I start giving to somebody else. I'm so full of myself, God can't fit nothing else in there. But if I would empty myself, then I become a vessel that God can pour into. For his givers shall never lack. Ah, this is, this is. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Verse 9. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if, if we do not grow weary. Right? He said a while ago, we talk about love for a few weeks and then everybody kind of moves on. We get weary with that message and we want something new to entertain us. Something new to dwell on. Something new to be taught. Love. What else? We can do everything else in this world and teach you everything else in this world. But if you don't have love, you are nothing. We already covered that. Though I, though I have all knowledge of all mysteries, yet I have not love. I'm nothing. Ah. And love is something where when you give it away, it comes back to you. There's a cycle. If I love them, well, what if they don't love me? It doesn't matter. God will love you. Well, I'm going to love them and they're going to hate me. Good. It means God will love you even more. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. And revile you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. For so persecuted they the prophets which went before you. You in good company when you love people and they hate you back. That describes the life of Jesus to a T. And because he suffered... At the hands of other people, God raised him up. Remember we talked about that last week. He loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, his God, anointed him with the oil of gladness above all his fellows. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap. If, if, that's huge, the biggest little word in the English language, if. If we do not grow weary, verse 10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And what is all of this in context? Helping somebody who's falling. Helping somebody who's struggling. There's a lot said there in that passage, but it's powerful. And that is what God is calling us to. That's what God is calling this church to. Not to hear a series on love. He's looking to transform us to be loving people who constantly practice love. Not who know love, 
Not who can speak about love, not who can quote verses about love, but people who can show love. Not the hearers are justified by the word. The doers, the doers are justified by the word of God. What are you going to be? A hearer or a doer? We got to do this. Let's pray. I want to invite everybody that will. Let's find a place around this front and pray concerning this word today. Father, we thank you for your word that has been ministered to us today. The word to sow and reap. The word to prepare ourselves, to get ourselves right, to get ourselves perfect before you. For as many of us as be perfect are thus minded. We, we, you're teaching us that mindset of perfection. How to achieve the high calling which is in Christ Jesus. And that, that teaching cannot be understood without a revelation of love. That's it. That's the key. There is nothing else to learn that's ever going to be greater or more life changing than love. Help us today, Father. Help us today. Change our minds. We have developed habits where our minds are constantly dominated with thoughts of self and our lives and our circumstances and what we're going to get. Change us today, Father. We crucify that carnal mind which Elder Waldron talked about. We deny ourselves. We take up that cross. We apply the cross to our own carnal minds of self and selfishness and self-centeredness and we crucify those thoughts today let your word nail those thoughts to a cross that they perish on this day and forevermore that we live in that state and laying aside the carnal mind we take upon us the spiritual mind which is love God and love his people. Invest ourselves. That we may invest ourselves. That we may sow to the spirit and not to the flesh. That's our prayer. Come on church, help me pray that today. In your own words, over your own life. Surrender your carnal mind to him. Allow the spiritual mind to be planted. That seed to be planted in us. That it may grow and develop. We surrender ourselves to you today through prayer. Let that work be done in us, oh God.